Well, hello and welcome. My name is Ken Steffes, and I am here to talk about the state of pro beach volleyball. Yes, what is the state of professional beach volleyball, both in the world and domestically in the United States? Um, it's raining here in Los Angeles, and that doesn't happen very often. As a matter of fact, there are only about six days in a year in Los Angeles where the weather's bad, and today is one of them. So I figured I uh, would put together some of my thoughts on the state of beach volleyball. And just for some of you that do not know, I was the first uh, Olympic gold medalist in beach volleyball. I won the gold medal in 1996 in Atlanta. I was a professional beach volleyball for many years, mostly back in the 90s, and have numerous records, including being number one in the world. And I was a world champion, as well as other things. But in addition to that, after I uh, played professional beach volleyball, I went to business school at Stanford University and got my MBA. So I have a business background as well. So I understand the business of sports. Not only that, uh, I was on the um, board of directors of the Association of Volleyball Professionals. I was also a player rep. So I represented the players in the Association of Volleyball Professionals at the board level, uh, kind of similar to what the IBPVA does today. And as such, I have insight into how to run a successful professional beach volleyball tour because I did it. All right. It uh, has never been more successful in the United States than it was in the 1990s. And it quite possibly might have been uh, bigger then back in the 1990s than it is now internationally, although it is much larger and wider as opposed to just uh, a sport that was uh, mostly focused in the United States. And of course, uh, as everyone knows, the Olympics is just an enormous event and a wonderful event. And um, it's coming up this year in 2024 in Paris, France. And I wish all of you athletes the best of luck. This is going to be a perspective from an athlete's perspective because I was an athlete, okay? Uh, I know that there's a lot of different stakeholders internationally in beach volleyball as well as domestically, and that's fine. And there is nothing wrong with advocating on the behalf and for the position of the athletes. And I make no bones about that. Uh, it is it is very, very, uh, it's, it's what I've done in the past and I am happy to do it now to make sure that the athletes get what uh, what they sort of deserve to get out of a sport uh, in terms of both the its growth, its direction, input into it, and of course, financially. And there's no problem with advocating for on behalf of the athletes financially. But first, before I get started, I would like to share with you all a few things from my life. And the first one thing I would like to share with you is this. Uh, this is the Olympic gold medal that I won in Atlanta in 1996. This is the one that they gave me after I won the finals. This is the first gold medal that has ever been awarded in the history of beach volleyball in the Olympics. And I uh, wear it with pride, as a matter of fact. Another thing I would like to show you is this little memento that I took from the Olympic games in Atlanta. This was, uh, a, I, I grabbed a bunch of sand from center court, from the actual Olympic volleyball uh, venue court. And I put it in this little vial and I've had this with me in my office or near me or close to, hmm, we're gonna have to be 28 years uh, this coming summer. And as you noticed, it used to be full up and it shrunk. <laughs> so either the sand is sort of condensed or maybe it, it, does, it does it evaporate? Does sand evaporate? Anyway, it used to be full. Now it is a nice little memento. From there, another thing I would like to share with you is a picture that I keep in my office as well. And this is a picture of match point in the Olympic Games in 1996. You can see in the top, there's a scoreboard. If you look closely, you will see that it is game point. Uh, I am the person at the net blocking. I am blocking Mike Whitmarsh, uh, the another American team who got the silver in that Olympic Games. The ball is hitting my hands right now and will shortly hit the sand which will be game point and we will win the Olympic gold medal. Kind of cool. Somebody took that picture and sent it to me. No idea, just for fan. Here's a picture of my partner, Karch Karai and I on the Olympic uh, podium uh, after we had received our gold medals from uh, Dr. Ruben Acosta. It was a very, very special day and a very special time. And I wish all you beach volleyball players of the world similar success. And I hope you 
uh, have uh, the ability to stand on that podium and win that gold medal as well. Anyway, just want to share that with you. A little bit of my past, uh, what sort of motivates me because what I'm motivated by, I've been involved in the sport of beach volleyball for 40 years now. I, I love beach volleyball. I love playing and I would wish it, I, I, I want nothing but to see it be successful, be big, uh, big tournaments, lots of fans, lots of prize money, a lot of television audience. So let's see if we can do that. All right. Let me share my screen. We'll get back to the presentation. All right. The State of Pro Beach Volleyball, an Athlete's Perspective by Ken Steffes. All right. First thing is, is that uh, there are various stakeholders in international beach volleyball. These are not all of them. They're just the ones uh, from the athlete's perspective, uh, includes the FIVB. Uh, currently or recently added to this mix is the for-profit entity volleyball world. Of course, you have the NGBs in the various countries, us, the players, your representatives, the IBVPA, uh, who represents your interests, and of course, the event or tournament promoters who are critical in making sure that we have a very successful tour and that there's a lot of fan interest and money. But first, I'd like to start with a little bit of history to see where we've come, because where we were was actually bigger than where we are now. And what I believe is we can not only be this big again now, but much bigger going forward in the future. So back in 2008, the FIVB tour consisted of uh, 21 men's events and 20 women events. Most of them uh, were combined events like they are now. And there was $8.3 million in prize money. Okay, $8.3 million in prize money for the beach volleyball players at that time. It is less now, and I will show you. In 2014, it seems to have hit its peak because there were uh, 17 events on the 2014 FIVB tour with nine and a half million in prize money. Okay, nine and a half million in prize money. Now, they also had sort of a bifurcated system where there were elite events, they called them grand slams, and then other events, which are now called challenge events. But if you'll notice, the, the majority of the prize money, the majority of that 9.45 million in prize money was in 10 events, okay? So, of those 10 events, two had a million dollars in prize money and eight of them had 800,000. So the beach volleyball players of 2014 uh, were able to compete in 10 events for $8.4 million in prize money or roughly $840,000 in prize money each. Again, both genders, right? In today's tour, last year's international uh, F uh, volleyball world 2023 tour there was only six million in prize money okay there was six million in prize money meaning there's less prize money now than there was in the past and that's not something that you see in sports you don't see that in sports now all right there's been an incredible growth in sports and sports attendance and sports viewership and in the money of sports as recently as the last 10 years and more frequently i mean the amount of money that is pouring into sports has been increasing exponentially, okay? And for some reason, beach volleyball, uh, both domestically in the United States and internationally, does not seem to be seeing that level of growth. And I believe it can. I believe we can reach not only the levels that we had before, but uh, uh, increase those levels. Now, again, you'll notice that uh, of the 21 events, the 11 Elite 16 events, right, that top tier versus the challenger, uh, there was only 4.5 million in prize money averaging about 409,000 each, okay? So if you go back to 2014, there was almost double the amount of prize money, okay? In a similar number of events, right? Double the prize money, 8.4 million in 10 events versus 4.5 million in 11 events, okay? And that's something that uh, the tour needs to get back to because a successful tour will have a limited number of elite events where all the athletes come and compete. And then there'll be uh, other, like there'll, there'll be other tiers of tours. You could have the Challenger Challenge Series and the Future Series uh, all integrated into an entire world uh, beach volleyball tour. And all right, so next year's proposal, they've got the dates uh, set, but they don't really have much information uh, attached to those events. And that's a problem, okay? There's a problem because in sports that are successful, uh, there is there there is a stability, and I'll talk about stability when it comes to sports in the events in this in the tour. Like you, you know that Wimbledon is going to be played 
this end of last week of June, first week of July, because it always has, you know, the World Cup has their date sets. The Olympics has their dates, not only for 2024, but 2028, 2032. They know where they're going to be played and they know what's going to happen. Whereas uh, beach volleyball, the volleyball world tour tends to be a little late in getting information out. And that's because they don't have things nailed down. And that's something that needs to be worked on. So uh, next year will be the 2024 Olympic Games, and that will dominate. Of course, everyone's thinking, everyone's thoughts, everyone's focus will be on those Olympic Games because they're just so much larger than anything else. All right, it, it is proposed that there will be a finals in Doha in December, but again, there's no information on that, and that there will be nine Elite 16 events next year. One of the things I'd like to point out is that there is a, too much variability in the Elite 16 tour events, Okay. Again, you don't, you don't find that in sports that are successful. In sports that are successful, they have consistent events on consistent dates that they continually work to grow. So, for example, uh, uh, Tlaxacala will not be hosting an event this year, even though they hosted an event last year, the World Championships, in the year, in an event the year before that. So the question is why? Why don't they wish to have another event this year? Did, they not, did it not work for them? Did they not make money? Was it not a benefit to them and their community? Uh, you know, you see you see events dropping off the calendar from year to year, and that's that's a bad thing. There used to be more there. There was a time there was a time back on the FIVB tour when there were more cities wanting to get on the tour on, on get events on the tour weeks on the tour than there were weeks during the summer, especially in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and uh, you know, the the tour was heavily European based back then, and none of the None of the uh, tournaments, none of the events, none of the cities wanted to give up their dates. You know, they they didn't want it because they loved putting on beach volleyball events. Uh, everybody was doing well back then. And you would see that now. You would see that now if things were going well. You would see not only events wanting to continue year in and year out, but you'd see other other entities, other cities, other other countries clamoring to get in. And you don't see that that's a problem. So, for example, the Uberlandia event is gone. Is that replaced by Natal? Well, why doesn't Uberlandia wish to continue on sponsoring a Elite 16 Pro Beach Volleyball Tournament? Same with Torque from two years ago. Uh, the Portugal event was in the Spina last year. Uh, I believe it was a challenger, a challenge event, and it's going to be an Elite 16. Is that the Spina event? So if, if they have gone from challenge to Elite 16, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But again, there's no information yet on the website. Or is it a different town in Portugal, right? That would not be a good thing. Of course, the bright spot, a really good bright spot is Vienna. So Vienna is going to have a uh, beach volleyball tournament uh, there. They have historically, the promoter there has historically uh, for a long time uh, promoted beach volleyball tournaments, FIVB beach volleyball tournaments in Austria, starting with Klagenfurt. And what was concerning was he, he was quoted in an article last year saying that the regulations and the restrictions that the FIVB had been putting on him got to the point where it wasn't worth it for him to put on a tournament. And that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing when a long-term successful promoter of a international beach volleyball tournament tells you that you're causing problems for him. So he ended up having a very successful European championship event in Vienna. It was on the Danube, on that island in the middle of Danube. And a good thing, good thing that they were able to work out bringing him back in and uh, hopefully allowing him to be hugely successful. And we'll talk about why that's important. Again, um, Jao Pissau, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. They used to be an elite 16 event. They've downgraded to a challenger event. And again, the question is why, why wasn't it working for them? Then you, all right. This is something I like to call the law of sport. And these laws are inviolable if you want to have a successful sport, okay? the every, If you do what's on these this list correctly, you will have a successful sport. And if you do not have a successful sport, you will find it somewhere on this page, okay? The first thing is venue, talent, and television, okay? Venue, talent, and television. All sports excel at these three things, all right? And the first is venue, all right? You have to have a place for the competition, for the sport, for the uh, for the, the tournament to happen, okay? But it can't just be any place. You can't just put some sand down, put some nets up, throw some volleyballs out, and call it a, a tournament, an event, all right? The venue has to be able to accommodate fans and the growth in fans. It has to be able to accommodate 
an actual competition, a tournament, a, a large tournament, an open tournament where anybody is invited. And we'll get into what it takes to have a competition in a second, right? But it also has to be a place that you can monetize, okay? So the venue has to be monetizable <clears throat> so that you can make money on the event, so that you can pay for the event and for prize money, as well as profit for all the people involved. The second thing you need is talent, okay? Which means you have to have the world's best beach volleyball players playing at your event. If you don't have the talent, the world's best beach volleyball players at an event, then why would fans come? Why would anybody want to watch it? Okay. There's been a problem on the elite 16 uh, events because they don't have the top 16 uh, beach volleyball teams there at every event. All right. I remember that event at Torquoy we talk about that they decided to not come back for a second year could have been the fact that the, the highest ranked team that went down there was number 11. Okay, so if you don't get the players to play, you're going to have problems growing your sport. Okay, the uh, idea is that you gather the world's best athletes in whatever sport and have them compete against each other. That's a sport. That's what a contest is. That's what people want to see. Now, when it comes to television, okay, that just that encompasses not just the uh, linear, you know, broadcast, but it, all, it includes the concept of audience, okay? So what a, what a sport has, what a successful sport has is an audience, either at the venue, watching it on streaming, or watching it live on television, okay? And that's important, right? Because you can, right now, the events, the tournaments, the action is being streamed behind a paywall, by volleyball TV, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so successful sports all have, are all firing well on these three things. Now, the next uh, part is we begin to get into the business of sport. These are laws that are inviolable, okay? What you do is you collect an audience and then you sell them something, okay? You collect an audience and you sell them something. You might sell them advertising, right? A sponsor might put up a banner so that it can be seen by the crowd. That will help them sell their product. You might wanna sell them tickets, you could sell them merchandise. You can sell them food and beverage at the event. Um, you could sell them a lot of things, okay? But the point is, is that it works in this order, okay? You have a competition, okay? A competition between the world's best athletes. A competition that matters both to the sport and to the athletes themselves, all right? That is what drives the whole ecosystem, okay? You can't, uh, what we know is that if you have exhibitions, if you have events where all the best athletes aren't participating, where you have events that aren't meaningful, what you find is that nobody cares about them. <clears throat> nobody shows up. Nobody wants to watch them, right? So that's, <clears throat> once you have that correct, <clears throat> excuse me, once you have a competition and what I call a real competition, and that has meaning from an artistic and an illusion sense, and I'll talk about that last, it'll be down there, but but it, it, you know it when you see it. You know when you have a real competition like the Olympics, okay? There's nothing in the sporting world like the Olympics. You know that in each of those individual sports, the world's greatest athletes have collected and want to win that gold medal, right? That's what drives an audience. So the competition brings the audience, right? Because again, if you have a competition without an audience, is it a competition? Like, Sports need fans and fans need to watch sports, okay? It, it would be no fun as athletes if we played all our competitions in front of nobody and nobody watched it, right? And it would be no fun for fans not to be able to watch the world's greatest athletes competing against each other in competitions that they seem they, they find meaningful. Okay, once you have this, once you have a competition that attracts an audience, you need to find a way to monetize it. And that is where the business of sports, the rubber meets the road. That is where <clears throat> you separate those that can do it from those that can't do it. All right, it's not easy to monetize sport. It's not easy to monetize a sport athlete. All right, it's 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 not the business of sport is different than other businesses. And people that are successful and know how to monetize sports do very well. And if your sport, if you've been able, if you have a competition and have attracted an audience and aren't making a lot of money, and that includes the athletes, something's going wrong. And we'll talk about that. Now we can keep, keep getting dragging down to an actual event, a tournament. Right, on site. Okay. What you find is that an event is a series of micro events driven by local influences. Okay. And what you need are best practices in audience attraction, development, retention, and experience, uh, uh, like audience experience, right? The problem with sports that are being run successfully is they don't have a local presence, a local promoter, someone who has got an interest in making that event 
super popular, super exciting, super profitable, okay? You have this tour, this top tour, the FIVB or the volleyball world or the United States, the AVP. And if they don't allow room for the promoter, the operator to do what they do best, which is attract audience on a local level, you're not going to get the, the, the scale that you need to be successful. And I mentioned that in regards to the Vienna promoter, the promoter from Vienna, Austria, right? He was having difficulty uh, of being able to run a successful event under the umbrella of the FIVB at the time. And that's a problem. So a lot of times, you know, it's kind of the dream of maybe volleyball world or the AVP to, you know, get a rights fee from somebody, you know, we're so, we're so big, we're so popular that people want to pay us to put on events and beach volleyball, at least at this point in its development, isn't there yet. You need to, uh, you need to allow space for them to do what they do best. And then he, the, this, the promoter, the person who's promoting the event will begin to then continue driving down into micro events. So he might have concerts or DJs or food event, or have VIP experiences, hospitality experiences, They'll bring in, you know, different groups that, that will drive attendance at your event, all right? And then all sports success is driven by something called complexity, narrative, and communication, okay? Sports are more complex, they're more popular, okay? Soccer, or what you call football, is a very complex sport. It's got a lot of moving parts. It's more That's why it's more popular. Same with American football. Same with other sports. Sports that have low complexity... Uh, such as the javelin I always bring up, you know, a person runs and throws a javelin, that is a low complexity sport. You know, beach volleyball is on the low end of the complexity scale because it's two athletes, okay, and you pass that hit, pass that hit, right? There's not a lot that goes on, it, but that's not a problem. There's not a problem with low complexity sports if you do the other things, which is narrative and communication. And narrative is basically the stories you can tell out of a sport. So you have to be able to develop a lot of stories, a lot of interesting things, a, a lot of things that will attract uh, audience, that will attract fans that, to want to come and watch, all right? And how you communicate that to the fans is important, not just in a sense of, you know, having a web, website and putting out information, but making sure it's very easy, all right? Communication is making it very easy for somebody to come and interact with your sport, a fan to interact with your sport, a sponsor to interact with your sport because they know what's going on. Okay, the perfect example of, of communication is the Olympics, Okay. Everybody knows what the Olympics is. It's been happening since 700 BC when Corvus, Corvus the cook, won the foot race and was the first Olympic champion almost 2,700 years ago. And we have been uh, competing in the Olympics, uh, you know, for a long time. All right. So everyone knows what the Olympics is and everyone knows what a gold medal is and everyone knows when it is. It's every four years. Everyone knows it's during the summer and everyone knows that the uh, world's best athletes will come and compete and all you have to do is turn on your television or set up your streaming and watch and it's very easy to communicate exactly what's going on you know tournaments like Wimbledon do that well the Masters Golf does that well the World Cup Soccer does that very well as well all right and next on the list of how you have the one of the laws of sport is people want to watch stars okay people want to see champions competing against each other at the highest levels okay the stars of sport, those are the ones that win, the champions that win multiple times. And you promote those stars, you promote the, the champions, you promote these battles between the world's best athletes because that's what's exciting to fans. That's what people want to see. You know, this is not something where everybody necessarily gets shy. You know, if you want to be a star, get it, you know, get in the gym more often, get to practice more often, you know, uh, get to 21 before uh, your competitors do and you will get to be a star and you'll be the one promoted because again, people want to see Messi. People want to see LeBron James. People want to see Tiger Woods. You know, more people want to see stars uh, than the other athletes, unfortunately. All right. There's still obviously people that want to see uh, all the athletes, but the vast majority of people want to want to watch a star. So a sport that's successful will make sure to inform the audience who the stars are. All right. Let's move on. Again, these are hard. Uh, these are iron laws of sport. But if you violate these laws, you will not be successful. And that is the problem, as I said, with beach volleyball, both internationally and domestically in the United States. Something is not, they're not doing something <clears throat> to best practices in these areas, right? So the first thing you notice about successful sports is that they have a structure, all right? They're all structured in a similar fashion, all right? And the reason that that is important is because the structure is what creates stability, all right? A sport must have stability. There, it must be stable from within a year and from year to year. 
Right. And that's been a problem uh, with beach volleyball is you're not quite sure which events are going to happen, where they're going to happen, how much prize money is going to be available, whether prize money is going to increase. Right. I mean, most sports over time get bigger and bigger. So, you know, if you get into it, you know, where you are now could get better in the future. <clears throat> and the point is, is that once you have this proper structure and this stability, all right, like a house, you have a platform now. And it's the platform in sports that is valuable. It's this platform in sports that is monetizable. Once you have this platform with this thing you can sell, that's when you get the benefits of owning, of being part of a sport. And that platform is almost always in the case of sports scalable. So you can televise, uh, it doesn't cost you any more to televise the 10 million people as it does the 1 million people, right? Within some limitations, you could have a thousand people in an event, or 20,000 people in an event, okay? It's not, it doesn't cost tw 20 times more money to accommodate those fans. You can <laughs> you can play for a million dollars in a beach volleyball tournament as easily as you can pay, play for $300,000 in a tournament, okay? And again, if you do it right, if you get the structure and the stability right, you will never want for money or fans or attendance or audience, okay? And you'll never want, you'll never want for that. And that's, that's how the laws of sport work. And last but not least, because this is what screws up a lot of business people. So you might have success in one business and you come into the business of sport and thinking and apply that success, but business is different or business of sport is different. Okay. It's got an element of art to it. All right. So you can't just become a great artist. If you were a successful business person, you can't be uh, a great uh, in Hollywood making movies or television. If you're great in business, because sport has a bit of art, like architecture in a sense, right? Because there's something called the illusion of sport, right? That people people have a trouble grasping sometimes. And this illusion is that sports have a character to themselves, which is outside the actual economic, um, uh, the basic economics of it, right? The, the dollars and cents. There's, you know, you know people, people know about sports and hear about sports. They might not necessarily uh, attend sporting events or watch a sporting event. It's that it's that uh, ex external, you know, um, it's an external benefit that sports has by its very nature. And if you don't understand how that works, if you don't get it right, for example, for example, it, it, the sport only works if the top athletes are there competing in a meaningful com uh, competition. You can't just say, "Hey, this is the global super awesome uh, championship," and expect people to believe you actually have to you, you to to actually to watch it or to be interested in it you actually it actually you actually have to have, it actually has to be true you know there's there's a little bit of sense of religion in it or belief systems in this okay like if the athletes don't believe in it uh if the fans don't believe that you're being authentic okay it has authenticity in it you're not going to be successful and you're usually going to fail okay so this is this is a visual representation of what i'm talking about for those that are visually more interested in this stuff. And th this is sort of a tour or a concept of a tour. And what you find is on the top level is uh, the, the, the individual events on a tour, right? And as you look in this big ball in the middle, right, is a representation of a tournament or an event. And as you can see, uh, a tournament is sliced up into very, very different parts. And it's got the, all the stakeholders surrounding it. So the, the tour or the players, sponsors, television and streaming, a promoter who drives local audience, the fans who come and watch and pay, right? On the outside, this clothing, shoes and equipment is, is what's called the industry surrounding a sport, right? So sports that are successful have an industry that surrounds them like tennis and golf with equipment and products and interest and things like that, okay? And beach volleyball has that. We have, we have shorts and we have sunscreen, we have, you know, sunglasses, but the the industry that surrounds the sport of beach volleyball hasn't been developed effectively in my opinion and that's one of the reasons why the sport is not as big as it could be right and on the right side again is this concept of the platform where once you have all these pieces together you have this platform which can become which can be monetized and is incredibly valuable but the problem is the problem is while it's simple uh in understanding it's complicated in execution because you have you have the interactions of all these stakeholders that are overlapping, okay? And sometimes there's cooperation and sometimes there's coopetition, right? So there's cooperative competition, right? Some of these entities are in competition with each other. 
So for example, if you have a for-profit entity like Volleyball World who wants to make a profit, uh, that could come at the expense of athletes who want to see in, want to see ever increasing prize money. And there's not a problem with uh, competition within uh, the stakeholders of a sport as long as it's managed correctly and everyone takes their place, which is why I have no problem advocating specifically for athletes in this in this case. Yes, I'd like to see the sport succeed. Yes, I'd like to see all the stakeholders uh, succeed, but I am I am perfectly happy, you know, being an advocate for a specific group of stakeholder, which is the athletes, because again, somebody has to, on their behalf, you know, uh, assert for them uh, in this sphere, because again, as you see, it's it, it, it can get overlapping, in, um, um, you know, that's I guess that's my point. And so the, 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 someone needs to advocate for those athletes. This is again a representation, a visual representation of a single tournament. All right, in the middle is the tournament of the prize money and, and the various entities that are it all interacting to make it a success. You have the FIVB or Volleyball World, the tour, okay? And they have an ability to generate revenue to the right. You have the promoter, the one who's on the ground, and they are trying to drive revenue and audience into the event space, all right? On the left side, you have the players, of course, who compete, right? And all these entities interact with each other uh, in a web of 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 working together and sort of you know trying to you know make it all work 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 successfully and on the bottom you have the local community okay it's very important that you don't lose sight of the city you know the country that you play in the local community that you play in and make sure that the community benefits okay you what you want is a is a a community that so benefits from your event that they want you back okay and that means uh, the local businesses uh, ha succeeded because your event came into town. The local um, citizens uh, enjoyed your event and found it to be beneficial. There was other entities and other you know, groups in the local the local environment that benefited from having you. You know, you're creating jobs in the local community as well, and that's a very important thing to also not not to lose sight of. Again, you want <laughs> you want sponsors to want to sponsor you. You know, fans that want to attend, promoters that want to promote you, and cities that want you to come, right? That's how you'll be successful, athletes. It's not that difficult. It really isn't. All right, and this is sort of how a tour structure works, right? Most people think that, you know, hey, Volleyball World, FIVB, we'll sit in Lausanne and we'll just like put up a website and you just, you know, if you want to put on a tournament, fill out our form and that's how it works. It's not how it works. There needs to be... You know, there's there's different, not not necessarily Elite 16 challenger futures, but within the Elite 16, within the ecosphere, there's certain ways you can organize a tour to make it more efficient. All right. You might have clusters of events in Europe and individual events around the world. You have to make sure you can't just put on events. They have to have some sort of like logical structure to them in terms of timing. All right. You can't be bouncing around between continents. You might want to do a South American swing and an Asian swing, a North American swing, and then into a European swing. All right. It's not always easy because you can't always get the timing right. But again, that's what you're driving towards. That's your ultimate. Again, if you are in the position where you have more promoters and more cities wanting you to come, then you could have more flexibility in making sure that it all works really well. Okay. And it does. It has. All right. It did work well. It did work well in 2014 and in the 2000s. All right. I was there. I saw it. All right. I know it's possible. So what is the state of the sport now? All right. This is Kent Steffes, former professional beach volleyball player, Olympic gold medalist. This is what I see after 40 years of watching this stuff. All right. Uh, first of all, next year, the Olympics are going to be huge. Yet again, beach volleyball will be one of the premier uh, sporting events in the Olympics. I think it's top five, all right? We will get a huge audience watching you athletes, and you will perform magnificently, all right? I assure you that two teams will win the gold medal, one women and one men. That's always the way it works. It's kind of funny that way, right? Somebody always wins the gold medal. All right, you're going to bring a lot of attention. The Olympics are going to bring a lot of attention to our sport, and that's a good thing. All right, but uh, there is a problem. There's a problem because... Is I when I we're let's go through those laws of sport and see how we're doing. All right, there's the structure, the challenge. There's a the structure of the international tour is challenged because you're attempting to integrate a nonprofit entity, the FIVB, with a for-profit entity, Volleyball World. And as I said, there's problems uh, creating a stability 
because the different uh, entities are sometimes working together, but sometimes working against each other, specifically in television, all right, as well as you know, their ability to, you know, sell tour sponsors and what they want to segment away. And we'll get into that a little bit. All right. There's a problem with the state of the sport because the tour prize money is not enough. All right. It's not enough because there was more in the past and it should be even higher than that. All right. That, that's a fact. And that's something the money's not bad. The money's not bad. But again, the tournaments are kind of too spread out. Uh, they're too kind of difficult to get to on a, on a logical and sort of reasonable basis. And that's not a good thing. That 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 could be that could be done better. As I said, the, the tour prize money is not bad. It's hard to get to them all. The athletes aren't going to them all, and it's not at historic levels. All right. There's no tour sponsor, right? There's no there's no Swatch World Tour like it used to be in the past, which is odd because what it tells me, what it tells me from someone who has experience in this is that they're not monetizing the platform efficiently. If they're monetizing the platform efficiently, or if they had the proper structure and stability, they would have a platform that would be valuable for a sponsor to want to sponsor. Okay. It's as simple as that. And you can integrate that with the, uh, with the individual uh, promoters as well. All right. You can even help to sell sponsors into the, in, into the individual events, which is what successful sports like tennis and golf do. All right. They work both on the tour level and on the promoter event level to bring in as much money uh, from sponsors as possible, as well as, you know, manage that aspect to, you know, VIP sales, you know, tour packages, you know, all that good stuff. I also see limited individual sponsorship opportunities for the athletes. Okay. When I was playing, half of my income came from non prize money sources. So sponsorships, exhibitions, non, non performance related stuff. And I don't see that with the athletes today. Right. Which means to me, again, uh, the athletes are having trouble monetizing the platform as well. The reason the athletes are having trouble monetizing the platform is because there's something wrong in the structure and the stability. I see it and it needs to be fixed or it should be fixed. OK, when we talk venue talent and television, let's see how the sport uh, is doing internationally on these on these situations. OK, venue. All right. First thing is, it seems to be difficult to retain events year to year, right? Maybe it's improving. I think it's improving, right? Because you need consistent, long-term, profitable partners and promoters for maximum growth, all right? A key to having a successful partner or promoter is that they are profitable, okay? They have to make money. It's as simple as that. This is not a charitable event. No one's going to lose money on beach volleyball events. So to the extent that you can make put them on in places that can be able to be monetized and make money you will have the consistency year in and year out all right this will create the greatest opportunities for the athletes all right stable consistent profitable events in major cities right stable consistent profitable events in major cities will give you the athletes the largest amount of money right that's the way it is why because that's where the money is right if you want to get you want to have lots of prize money in your sport beach volleyball players, you're going to put them where the money is. All right, let's talk about talent now. All right, the problem with the Elite 16 is it doesn't seem the, like those events are attracting the top 16 uh, teams at every event. And that's a problem. Again, you attract the world's great, uh, greatest athletes and you have them play against each other. And that's not happening. Why? Many reasons. The money's not there. Uh, the tour sort of like the, the, the tour, or the, it's too spread out. It's too all over the place. And that needs to be fixed, okay? What, what not having talent does is impedes the attraction of the audience, right? Who wants to watch an athletic contest where the best athletes aren't there? Smaller number. Smaller number will, okay? Again, a world collects the world's best beach volleyball players and has them compete against each other, period. It's what a foundation of a sport is. Tell me, a, tell me the event last year. Tell me whether the top athletes were there. I'll tell you if it was successful or not. It's pretty much that simple. Uh, television, all right? There's a problem uh, in the state of sport with television because the events are only being broadcast on volleyball TV behind a paywall. And that's fine. And it's it's somewhat successful in some sports that are already super large and super successful, okay? The problem with a sport the size of beach volleyball is you don't necessarily have the audience at this point in time to be able to pull that off. And it restricts, right? So it's gonna right out of the gate restrict the size of your audience in potential for growth right people don't know they don't like it they don't know like no one's going to pay money 
to you know get a streaming service when they don't even know whether they're going to like watching the sport. Okay, I've I've heard some difficult rumors that they only have two hundred fifty thousand subscribers at volleyball TV. If that's the case, that would be a disaster. I hope they are doing better. I really do because I would like to see it be successful. All right. In my opinion, each event should have at least national, uh, which is free. Uh, broadcast free telecast on the national level so the vienna event that event should be broadcast in austria if not germany as well right in order to again get uh get an audience get an attraction grow uh, the sport i get it you're trying to raise money uh through uh, putting it behind a paywall but a little bit of a chicken and egg thing here because what you find with successful sports and this is again part of the business of sports is some of the most successful sports and sports in general remember the illusion of sport, the, the the religion of sport, the art of sport is that of all businesses, this business of sport gives away a lot of its content free. It always has historically, you know, the, most of your audience is going to consume your sport for free or low cost. So if you put it behind paywalls or the only time they can get there is if they buy an expensive ticket, you're not going to be a successful sport. And that's a problem that the business of sport has because you have to give away enough free content to make people interested while monetizing what you can from what's left, right? And the people that are successful doing that do it well, but the people that aren't successful don't understand that, okay? This is what I call the tragedy of the federation, all right? <laughs> now, the FIVB is a federation organized in the IOC and has a very broad mandate, okay? And it does it very well. The, the FIVB does, it, does its job very well. The problem is it's not... It's, its focus is not us beach volleyball players, you beach volleyball players, and making sure that you get maximum uh, prize money, maximum other economic opportunities, and maximum audience, okay? They have a lot of things to do, a lot of things to do, and they do them very well. They have the indoors, of course. They have youth. They have development. They have referees. Uh, they have coaching certification. They have uh, the, the grow of the sport internationally, okay? And they do those things very well. I am by far not criticizing the FIVB. I am only saying that as athletes, we need to advocate for our small our small sliver, our small section, okay? What I'm talking about here is the advocation for the be professional beach volleyball at the elite level, all right? Because that's different than a lot of the other programs, a lot of the other mandate that the FIVB has, all right? And so, you know, uh, what you need to do on the youth side, on the growing the game international side, on the referee side, on the rules side is far different than what uh, what needs to happen on the elite professional business of sport level, right? So you athletes should not be shy in making sure that that's uh, up to up to you know up to best practices, really. Right. And so even though it has a broad mandate that is doing well, it has the ability and the obligation to do better, in my opinion. All right. It has the ability to do better because it's done better in the past. The FIVB has. Uh, and I believe it has the obligation to do it because that's its mission. Part of its mission is uh, to promote beach volleyball throughout the entire pyramid. OK, from the amateur, from the participation to the elite, to the top. All right. And that includes the professional level. All right. It's an obligation that they have to make the, to continue to grow as, as big as possible, that small section, right? They don't spend, they're not gonna spend all their time on it. I get that. And that's not a problem, right? I, they can do it. It's done in the past and it could be bigger than it is, all right? So what I propose is, I always have a proposal. What I propose, I've always said something called Vision 2020. That's always been my grand proposal. If anybody's heard me or listened to me speak, that is 20 beach volleyball tournaments, $20 million, okay? That's a great goal. It's not going to happen next year, but it could happen. And it could happen in a pretty, pretty quick time frame. I mean, there's been many multiple $1 million prize money tournaments. Um, going back uh, 10 years ago, there was two $1 million prize money tournaments and uh, eight, $800,000 tournaments. So they were close back then. But what I propose is this as a mission of the International Pro Beach Volleyball Tour, including all the stakeholders, Okay. Uh, and th the important thing to understand when you have a mission is that it is uh, it is easily definable, okay? Uh, mission statements that are, we'll be the best, or we'll grade, or be awesome, or have language that is not specific, aren't beneficial, all right? 
I grow the game of volleyball is a wonderful thing to do, but it's not specific enough. How is the point? A proper mission statement, at least from what I learned at Stanford Business School, and that is one of the best business schools in the country, so I would believe them, and you should too, is that to the extent that your mission statement is specific and has defined and measurable uh, outcomes, it will be more specific. So let's get started. There's 10 things I think we can do uh, as a community. First, all right, right away, we're going to have 10 open, okay, open elite level tournaments. Now, that's consistent with the FIV's policy of the country quotas. Okay, I'm fine with that, right? But you're going to allow the world's volleyball players to come. And, you know, and, and all right, so wait, 10 open elite level tournaments with 10 million in prize money, right? That's 10 tournaments, a million dollars each now. And it can happen, and I know it can happen because I've, I've seen it happen, <laughs> okay? And I understand the sports, and I understand the business sports, and I understand the business of beach volleyball. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Like, uh, well, yes. Uh, I know there's, uh, there's people who advocate differently. Oh, uh, the cost, uh, we have too, not, in a, not enough courts, uh, expense of the promoter. I, I get that. What I'm telling you is I don't agree. Okay. I've seen that you can have an open tournament that works with everybody benefiting, everybody profiting, uh, including high levels of prize money. So it's happened in the past. So I, I find those excuses to be less than satisfying, I guess I would say, right? But they're there. And again, that's why someone needs to advocate on behalf of the athletes, because someone needs to say, no, like, no, we want to have an open event of that. Because again, you, you attract the world's best athletes, and you have them compete against each other. And how do you know the best athletes are there if they can't get there? you know, and, and, and at least an easily, you know, way. And we'll talk about it even with the next generation. All right. That's the top level. 10, 10 tournaments, $10 million next year. Probably not, but for sure, for sure. 2025, right? No excuses, right? If you didn't do it, right? International Beach Volleyball Tour, you failed in your mission. So the second level is going to be 10 open challenge level tournaments again with the consistent with the country quotas with $3 million, right? That's $300,000 in a minute. All right. I, I, I think that's for sure doable. All right. Now, the next part of the mission of the International Beach Volleyball Tour would be to increase non-competition economic benefits and opportunities for the world's pro beach volleyball athletes. All right. Again, non-economic benefits, benefits such as sponsorships and non-economic opportunities outside of the competition prize money space. OK, that's what I'm talking about. This is outside the competition prize money space. Half of their income should be being derived outside of the prize money space. And that is something that we can define and we can see how we're doing against it. All right. Now, again, I'm advocating for athletes and I have no compunction doing that. <laughs> no, no problem at all. But now we have to say what we in return as athletes or you in return as athletes will be willing to do. Right. Because it's a give and take. And what I'm proposing as a mission is that the we have 100 percent participation of the world's uh, top BVB players in all elite level tournaments. Okay. 100% participation of the top 16 or the top teams in all these elite events. All right. There's no excuses. Uh, if there's, a, if there's, if you have 10 elite tournaments with $1 million in them, all you guys are going to be there. Period. All right. I get the travel sucks. I did the travel. Uh, I been in the hotel rooms. I missed the family. I get it. All right. And then of course, support for the challenge events. And there's ways, there's historical ways that other sports have done that in terms of like making sure that all the challenge events have a good supply of top athletes. Again, you know, it, it, you athletes are going to commit to showing up and playing and the tour, the tournament, beach volleyball is going to commit back to you that they're going to have these levels of events. All right. The next item on our mission statement is everybody is going to work to ensure that our event partners and promoters and our partners in the business, like our partners in beach volleyball, right? That's volleyball world included, uh, can produce large profitable BV beach volleyball tournaments. Okay. It, it is going to be the mission of the international beach volleyball tour to make sure that the promoted events, the events, these 10 open events, uh, elite level, these 10 challenge events are successful and profitable for the people that put them on as well as it's 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 a good deal for our sponsors it's a good deal for all any other partner that's involved in the professional elite level beach volleyball okay that should be part of our mission again that's going to drive 
uh, others to want to get involved and put on these beach volleyball tournaments with this large amount of prize money. You see where I'm going here? All right. Everybody's working together. Everybody's move, pushing on the mission to move it up. And everybody's benefiting. Okay. That includes the FIVB too. Uh, all right. Number six. All right. We want to measure and make sure we are growing uh, consistently attendance at beach volleyball events in our global television viewership. All right. Both streaming and linear of these beach volleyball events. They used to publish these numbers. Uh, the FIB used to publish attendance numbers and uh, how many people are were watching the telecast. And I'm pretty sure they're not anymore because the numbers are not good. All right. I'm sure they do not want to, you know, but they, they do publish impressions and you know look the the cpms on impressions is not going to get you very far unless you get a lot of them all right but again it's it's people coming to tournaments it's people watching the actual telecast that's going to matter okay uh, that needs to be that needs to be tracked and grown and we need to be able to see whether or not we are doing well so that we can make adjustments or the, the international beach volleyball tour professional beach volleyball tour can monitor it and make sure it's growing all right uh, number seven we have to make sure that we provide the maximum fan experience at events all right and prevent and again this is important provide the fans the ability to easily consume professional beach volleyball content at a reasonable cost and of course partially for free so there has to be a part of our professional beach volleyball tour and events that's free for people so we can continue to tr get larger and larger and it's got to be easy to consume, okay? It's got to be easy to come to a tournament and, 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 you know, a reasonable cost or at least certain cost categories. It's got to be easy to consume online. They got to, there has to be a place where they can go, find it, and see it or know what's coming on, all right? We, again, we can track that and monitor it to see whether or not we're doing well. N number eight, and this is important too, as we talked about before, we need to provide meaningful, positive, economic, and non-economic impact on the communities where pro beach volleyball events occur. So, it has to be a positive economic impact, right? But it's got to be also a positive non-economic non impact, right? Because it's not just about money on the local level, right? So we have to provide a benefit to the cities and communities in which we participate, in which we play in. You know, the, the citizens and the people have to see a benefit for us coming to their town. We have to want, we have, we have to want them to want us to come, okay? Uh, <laughs> again, this is not this is not challenging or difficult stuff, but it takes it it takes a required effort in keeping your eye on the ball, right? Like keeping your eye on the on the serve, right? Keeping your eye on the ball when you hit the ball. You take your eye off the ball, and next thing you know, you're, you're going backwards like we have been for the past ten years. Okay, nine. All right, maximize. We all need to work together to maximize monetization of this global BVB tour platform. Okay, we're gonna get it the right structure. We're going to get it stable, and then we're going to have this platform, and all of us are going to work together to maximize the monetization, right? Then we're going to fight over who gets what part, all right? Trust me. Um, uh, <laughs> like What usually happens is you fight, we call it uh, you know, dividing the pizza. <laughs> to where, so if everyone's fighting over the pizza, as opposed to growing the size of the pizza, right? First we go the size of the pizza, then we fight over who gets what, and that's fine as long as everybody's well represented, all right? So we're going to, again, for the benefit of the FIVB, right? FIVB's got a benefit financially too. They can't just be paying money out. They have to be making money on the professional Pro Beach Volleyball Tour. The athletes have to be well compensated on levels of uh, the, uh, professional athletes. Partners are promoters. Volleyball, you know, world has to do it. And the local, community, the local communities and other stakeholders, right? We're going to grow this platform. We're going to monetize the crack at, crap out of it. And then we're going to distribute it out to the various stakeholders. And it's going to be, again, there's, 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 there's all the successful sports have metrics and models. Like, so NBA, NFL, MLB, baseball, and NHL, the hockey leagues in the United States, it's 50% of revenue for the athletes, right? And tennis and golf, it's between 25 and 30%, right? So anywhere between 25 and 50% of total revenue is what you're going to get you normally as athletes. Okay. And, you know, kind of depends on this. The, the larger you get, the, again, the larger you get, the more percentage of the sport you get too. <laughs> kind of funny. So like sports like football and NBA basketball, which are huge, their athletes get 50%, you know, some of the sports that aren't as big as those, they get a lower percent. So again, everybody's got a benefit from growing. Last but not least, last but not least, it needs to be the mission of the International Professional Beach Volleyball Tour to ensure that the next generation of great 
Beach volleyball athletes has a straightforward, easy, and low cost path to enter into and compete on the International Pro Beach Volleyball Tour. That next generation of athletes, all right? I played in 1996. Other athletes played between us and now, and now you guys. You guys are the ones who are competing at the highest level. You guys are the ones who are going to the Olympics, all right? Part of your mission needs to be to ensure that the next generation of athletes has an easy, straightforward, and low cost way to get on the Beach Volleyball Tour. Again, we collect the world's best athletes, and we have them compete against each other. How do we know that we have the world's greatest athletes? Because the next generation has an easy, straightforward, low-cost way to get into the tournaments. If you make it complicated and difficult to get on the tour or expensive to get on the tour, you're not going to have a successful sport. Trust me. Okay? That is your 10 items, all right? Uh, the 10 bullet points, the 10 items for your mission statement. I guarantee you, if you here, here's the first, here's the first five. If you if you set this as your mission, uh, international professional beach volleyball player, but international beach volleyball tour and players, if this is your mission, and you uh, work uh, day in and day out, you know, throughout the years and throughout the years on these ten items, you will have an enormously successful international beach volleyball tour where everyone benefits including you, the athletes. So I'd like to end this uh, podcast, this state of the sport from a uh, former Olympic beach volleyball player, uh, Ken Steffes, to say this to you, you know, to the beach volleyball athletes of the world, 2024 is Olympic year. You go for that gold, okay? Get to get gym, get to the practice, watch your videotape, get to know your opponents, go win, all right? I know you can do it. And lastly, Lastly, uh, I hope you can work to achieve a successful and profitable international tour. I really do. I hope you I hope everybody uh, wants to do that and wants to see it. I know, like I said, it was it was it was awesome uh, when I played in the 1990s uh, to play on a tour that was that large and that popular and that successful. And to watch, you know, what happened as we is when we got put in the Olympics in the mid 90s, it was the most exciting thing to happen to us as athletes. Uh, you know, you guys don't know it so much because it's been the Olympics forever. Right? It's been, <laughs> been the Olympics for a long time, but it wasn't the Olympics one time. And then it was, and we were all excited. And then we began to grow the sport internationally and the tour internationally and the event internationally. And it was just fun. And hopefully you guys can do work to do the same. All right. You have a great, you have a great base, great, great spot time to then vault up to the levels, even that, but even higher than we do. And I hope you do. I wish you all the best of success and uh, thank you for listening. All right. Go for the goal. All right.